today. We thank you for your love and your watch care and your grace. We ask now that you would lead us today in this meeting. We ask you to bless each one that's here. We pray for our military personnel all over the world, especially their families here today. Stay slide. We pray for each one of us as we make decisions for our nation. Forgive us for our sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. legislation, which is uh, prior to the agendas being posted, and that's the deadline we try to meet in order for Shelly to get them copied in, in the packet. So if you would talk to your people and remind them that we have a 10-day rule? Yes, we will do that. So if we can go over them, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, family. <coughs> now, any other questions before we get started with the report? Uh, Sharon? Coming to the end of my birthday month, eh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is that a big milestone? Or? Well, I know you probably don't care, but I do. <laughs> when you turn 50, you don't have to run the PEB anymore, or the physical fitness. You can oh. walk it. So, <laughs> I am going to be a walker this year. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, and you've got my report. Yes, it was a little late. 
uh, from the 10 days. And so if you have any questions or I can go through it either way. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Bezer. Uh, Sharon, I was just uh, talking to some people, actually one of the marshals last night, and understand we lost a marshal or he took another job. Been a marshal for like six or seven years. Redcorn, yes. Jim Redcorn. He's actually been with us about 13 years. 13 years, and it really, uh, and I think I've said this before, that uh, it disturbs me or it aggravates me that we lose people that we've had for 13 years here. And I realize you took another job that probably pays considerable more, but I think we talked about this last month about looking at uh, evaluating those positions again and getting them up to where we don't lose people. Because I understand, you know, you you hard engineer, you hard some tech people in here and train them or let them work for three or four years. That uh, you know, you got all that money invested, in and we need to try to retain those people. So I'm just. Say it again, you know, let's let's get on the stick and let's reevaluate those positions. And that is my responsibility to get that done a little quicker. Uh, we've talked about it and and this is the best time for me to do that because with the personnel at a lower level right now, if I can get their pay up, then I wouldn't have to lay anybody off. If I got their pay up with full staff, I'd probably have some issues of how I was going to keep it funded. So this is my opportune time to try to get their pay at a level that's competitive to the rest of the police world. And, and how many positions do we not have filled now? Seven. Seven, is there okay. we, we had ran uh, some openings for three marshals. We had five different panels, and none of those marshals on those panels could either pass the background or pass the physical fitness or uh, different variants. And, because our application, uh, because the pay is at a level, we're not getting that high grade applicant coming in like we did four years ago, five years ago. Mr. Hoff, did you hear I asked about a report on the incident in Adair County last time? What it was done? You got it ready yet? I can email you the results on that. Um, Okay, can you get that? Yeah. I've, in fact, I've got to ask them for their results. They gave me a verbal that they're supposed to follow up with a written from the review board. So I'll follow up with them, and I'll try to get that to you either this afternoon or in the morning. Okay, i got one more question for the last this calendar next meeting. I'm looking at two bids that's out on the website. Since we're going through Terra, I've been looking at it and keeping up, keeping up with them. There's two bids on the website requesting a 2005 Chevy Tahoe and a 2007 Dodge Durango to the Marshal Service. And then I started looking at it, and here's my question. It's requesting a 2005 Chevy Tahoe, four-wheel drive, four-door, mileage under 25,000. They want it to be white, you want it to have a roof rack, running boards, an AM, FM, and CD radio, power windows, locks, mirrors, and it, you want to include the three-year, 36,000-mile warranty, and then you all have the extra equipment on here you want. Well. And the only one you read, it doesn't need a CD, but it needs all of the it? other. Because if you, we have a truck that does not have power locks, power windows. And the thing is, people come up to talk to you on this side of your vehicle. You can't get over there because I try to reach across and try to do that. And the other is, if you don't have power locks, uh, when you have to get out in an emergency, you don't always take your keys out. You can click that button and keep going. So power locks are pretty important. Okay. Well, I, I, what I'm curious about is I know you all had a bid out there in December of last year because you all called several vendors up that I knew of, and you requested a four-door fill-wheel drive 08 or 09 vehicle, and that's all you all give them. But then when I seen this request, to be quite honest, I had several questions of Jody. Is it already picked out? I thought this was a competitive bid process. Is what questions that's asked to me, and especially on, and then somebody asked me, is, do you want the manufacturer's warranty or do you want one of them aftermarket insurance warranties? Because it does request a warranty. On the warranty, I'm not sure what they're requesting. I'll have to ask the uh, um, mm -hmm. manager over that. It is refurbished, mm -hmm. and that's why they are that low, and there's only two in the area I know that do refurbished cars. One's just across the line in Arkansas, and one's up at Vanita. So if anybody else comes up with a car that's like that, 
but we were looking at the refurbished because their price is so low. We can, if you went to So get, you have a car picked out? We have a style of car picked out, yeah, from one of those places. So it's going to be a 2005 Chevy Tahoe that you all... Uh, unless I'm you, curious, why didn't you sole source it if you already had it picked out? Um, as far as I know on the capital acquisitions, they don't like you to sole source it. And then anything that we looked for, I mean, if you sole source it, it's a whole other mm -hmm. issue. So we try to fall within those policies. <laughs> but we do go out and try to find something of, uh, of, of an amount that we can afford. So basically it's just because it looks bad to sole source it, in a nutshell. No, because I've tried to sole source at different times and it gets kicked back and we need to do a bid process. We need to do a bid process. Well, so I we give them all of our information that we've looked at on a uh, on any piece of equipment and then they bid it out. Okay. Um, well, they was curious because I was, you know, a 2005 Chevy Tahoe, you know, was real specific about the mileage and that's why I'm asking you. I don't know that we had to be specific, but we were because we didn't want a high mileage refurbished car. They do have refurbished vehicles that are even cheaper, but then you get into the 60,000 miles or the 70,000. We're replacing cars that have over 200,000, so we want to start with the uh, <coughs> best mileage on a vehicle that we can find. Okay. Uh, and, and just a comment, you know, it, it, the appearance shows that we've already located the dealer to get these here, and, and I think that's what Councilor Fishing Hawk is alluding to. That uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's something we may want to look at to see how you do this in the future. So I, I agree you know, with what you're saying. It looks like you're a bit shocked, to be honest with you. And, and I guess we. Yeah. I guess I do, and it's sort of a catch-22. If we don't go out and look for it and tell them exactly what we want, then they, uh, the purchasing area comes back and says, well, you didn't give us enough information. You have to give us the exact stuff or we can't bid it. So then we go out and look for it, and we find, you know, and we ask them, okay, can you write it up on a bid, uh, you know, on a estimate and give it to us? And they do that, and then we turn that in and say, this is the specs on a like vehicle that if you can find it so and, and, I guess know, it is uh, and, like that but I don't know how to get around it and then I don't see anything wrong with that as long as it's uh, open to every bidder in the market out there you know if those two people are the only one that got a car like that then you know so what but I just think we need to make it <coughs> it's open on the open market which sounded me like it was so I don't um, see a great big problem with it and I don't mind to work with them to ask them how better to do that, but that's the whole process. Once you turn something in, just say, I need a car. Uh, well, no, under I agree. this amount of money, they'll say, well, we have to be more specific. Go out and find us a car for that amount of money. Well, I think, I think it was handled you know, probably the way it should have been handled, because if it's on the open market, then it's on the open market. Thank you. So, so can a Ford dealer call you up and say, I don't have this, but I have something comparable to a Ford, and you might look at it instead of this specific one you want? Mm -hmm. That's all. Any other questions? Ms. Wright? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Morton, are you reporting for the Justice <laughs> Department? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Do you mind going ahead and talking about GEG? in your conversation. Okay. Uh, let's start with GEG. I do not have any new information. I will check and see and make a report next month to see if we have anything new on that. Um, did submit a report and are there any questions in addition to the report submitted? <coughs> kind of changed the format a little bit went by subject matter. Um, Ms. Go back to the GEG. Where exactly are we on GEG, and why has it just stayed at the same point for so long? Or is that a question better suited for Diane? Yes, I can. It's still an investigation. Part of that uh, is because it's not actually our investigation. It's the Fed's investigation. They have uh, allowed us to have one investigator assigned to their team that's doing that. Um, it hasn't moved 
quickly, but they have kept it open. And the last real movement we saw on it, which was several, uh, probably three months or so ago, was they had issued more subpoenas for more records for them to go through. And um, <coughs> other than that, we don't have further information, and they're still looking at those records, and they haven't issued any more subpoenas. But it's actually a Fed's case, and they just actually allow us to have a investigator on their team, and there's, I think, four people on the team. So it, when you say Feds, are you saying FBI or it's Federal FBI. Or? Well, the, uh, the team has two FBI, a IRS, and uh, one of our investigators on it. And how long has the investigation been going on? Almost two, two years. years. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, are we waiting for somebody to die or what? <laughs> That I can't answer you. I just know that. <laughs> Keep bringing in more records from various financial institutions, and um, they, they tell us it's still open. I mean, about every month, the investigator says it's still open, but it's also. Um, <clears throat> let me think of the number. Where you can't discuss. They have a. When you go through that, my mind's blank, and I know it. It's a thirteen A or something to where you cannot okay. talk about that. So it's not ready. If it's still with the FBI, it's not ready to go to the federal prosecutor, and then it's not ready to go to a grand jury. Correct. Yes. Any other questions for Mr. Morton? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Talk to me about the Williamsville lawsuit that I see on, because I think that's important. Okay. I'll check on the status of those with ICI. Is my understanding there is an ongoing bankruptcy case <laughs> pertaining to the same party, so I will check the status of all the cases. Okay. I'd like to see all the cases. Thank you. Being here. Mr. Baker. Madam Chairman, uh, at this time, if I could, I need the agenda to add a item 17. Uh, I think everybody's got the resolution in front of them. It's pertaining to uh, uh, recognizing uh, Sam Bradford uh, in resolution form, and I put that in form of motion. Second. Any discussion on amending the agenda? All in favor, signify the same light. Aye. 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 Same sign. Motion carried. <clears throat> that would be item 17 under new business. Um, the fourth report is election commission. Is anyone here from election? We do have the written report. Um, item five is uh, Ms. Swepston, tax commission. If you have my report, I'll try to answer any questions that you have about that report or any other items. Any questions for Ms. Swepson? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sharon, I just uh, explain or tell us how. On your number one bullet, 17.4 increase, and then a 90.54 increase on the uh, tax rate. <coughs> so how, how, what happened? Okay. Because of the way that the new compact came in on our border stores, the reason that looks that way for the month uh -huh. is because on your border stores, the state gets uh, 258 and we get 407 of that. So that really increased our revenue for those stores that are considered a border store. So it really upped our revenue. Now you're going to see that revenue drop because Arkansas's new law went into effect March 1. So that means we no longer have those stores that were considered Arkansas border stores are not border stores anymore. So that tax reverts. We'll get a dollar and a half instead of the 407, and the state will get 515 of those Arkansas that was considered Arkansas border stores. So that huge increase is due to the way that that was split out from the 665. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you know yet how the new federal tax will affect our structure? 
it's across the board. It's to everybody. So any price increase that we receive, every other store should receive that increase also. And I believe it's around six dollars and something a carton. But your name brands like Philip Morris, uh, different ones like that, they've increased. The, they've already increased the price of their product by nine dollars and something a carton. So they've done a price increase, plus they tack on that $6.20, even though they didn't say it was a tax, what they're saying is this is our price increase of $9 and something, so when the new tax comes in in April 1, we're not going to raise our prices anymore. But in March, they're already paid the last two or three weeks, they've already been paying that additional $9 and something. Now, you will, if you hear some of your shops or people complaining that they're going to be low on inventory at the end of the month, a lot of them are letting their inventories die down because anything they have on their floor as of April 1, they have to pay the federal tax on it. So if they've already paid this price increase of $9 and something, they got it sitting in their shop April 1, they're going to have to pay an additional $6.20 per carton on that product. So you're going to see a lot of your stores that's going to let their inventory die down and then go back April 2nd and, and repurchase their inventory. So, but it shouldn't change anything uh, disadvantage or advantage-wise because that is a tax across the board to everyone. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Sharon. Self-governance. Um, there she is, Miss Handy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good time. <laughs> I just came straight from the airport and I have spent most of the night in, a, in an airport, so. Um, you do have your report. Is there anything you want to add to it um, briefly? The only thing that uh, I can think of right off is uh, we have submitted a uh, uh, Prompt Payment Act claim uh, for some funds that we were not paid on IHS, and we just did that recently. So we should be getting some responses on that within the next few weeks. Um, I just came back from a, uh, a roads coordinating committee meeting, and. Uh, the infamous question 10, uh, in case you don't know what that is, it's in regards to the uh, uh, what's going to be defined as, as reservation roads or, or uh, Indian reservation roads, and uh, that's really becoming a hot topic, um, very heated. And so uh, we probably need to, um, we've already started addressing that. Uh, <coughs> And also the uh, uh, roads reauthorization is coming up, and so there's a lot of things going on with roads. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of information coming out about the stimulus funds. Uh, and uh, I've been assigned to track and uh, uh, be the central contact for the stimulus funds, other than housing, which is going to go through Marvin. But uh, you have the rest of my report. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. Uh, any questions for Ms. Handy? Yes, Mr. Bethard. I just, uh, just want to comment on what Vicki is saying. It's, it is it's really disturbing, and I think the council needs to be aware of what's going on on the roads issues. But I think the Cherokee Nation received almost 12 to $13 million a year for roads. And it's because it's called the Indian Reservation Road Program. And what's happening, and correct me if I'm wrong, Vicki, but what I'm reading is some of the other tribes are wanting to actually not say Oklahoma is deserving of Indian Reservation Road dollars. Right. Now, this coordinating committee that she's talking about is a committee that makes a recommendation to D.C., to the staff in D.C. And if they come to a vote, I'll guarantee you the large tribes of Cherokee Nation are going to lose out because there's so many tribes that belong that have Indian reservations, they have Indian reservations, and Oklahoma is a unique state that we don't have those classifications. And we have 37 tribes in Oklahoma, and they bring in over 50 million dollars a year. And if those other tribes get their way, we're going to lose those funds. So, it's, you know, at some point in time, uh, 
Well, they may ask some of the council members to go to some of these committees and testify, and, and I'd certainly be glad to go and volunteer to testify to those committees. So be aware, you know, this is serious stuff. If it comes to a vote, uh, don't come to trial going to lose. There's no doubt about that. So just keep it on your radar screen and, and make sure we keep abreast of that. And please they, keep us informed of the two business. They have set up a meeting uh, <coughs> with uh, Senate staffers tomorrow, uh, and I apprised uh, Paula of that, and um, uh, she's going to be there. And we also sent uh, information to the Oklahoma delegation, not just Senate, but, but the House as well, to keep them informed and to provide them with information so that um, they have the information to, to uh, uh, can I say that? Um, well, so that they can be well informed to debate that issue when it comes up. And just to follow up on that, if, if, uh, if, if some of the council members or even the audience would like to, to write our Oklahoma delegation, it would certainly be who's going to do it. So I think what you just said, Vicki, that you send them the figures and stuff of what Oklahoma reached from those Indian reservations, those program, and it's well over 50 million a year. So it will certainly have an impact on the state of Oklahoma. So I think we can have their support as far as supporting any bill or legislation that we want to bring up. So anyway, thank you. Ms. Fishy Talk. Well, that was, one of my questions was, we want to ask Harley what we need to do about that and what he... And would you suggest that, Vicki, that they call the senators <coughs> and congressmen and let them know what... Uh, Absolutely. My second question is, can you speak to that prompt, kind of that prompt payment we're wanting from the federal government? As far as... What you talked about earlier in your report. Well... The money. Well, that's... Uh, of course, the Prompt Payment Act is a federal act. Um, it's got stipulations in there as to how you calculate the funds, and it, it really comes, in this particular instance, it was really difficult to uh, do that calculation because what actually happens is um, when our third-party revenue uh, gets transmitted, it goes to uh, PNC Bank via IHS, in essence, and it's sitting there until uh, they get the detail as to how to split that those funds out. Um, they had some issues with their uh, uh, new accounting system, their new financial system. Uh, were told, and so they had difficulty in getting that detail for the split out, uh, and then therefore sending out the money. Um, so we went in and, and took those invoice by invoice and did a calculation of what we believe the uh, prompt payment <laughs> and penalties are on that. Now they they could differ. A little bit from what we calculated, but but we submitted an estimate, and then they can tell us whether they agree or. Anything else? Anyone else? Any questions? Thank you, Vicki. Get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hummingbird or someone from gaming. <coughs> Mr. Embry, I know we're ready to go on modification. Yes, the uh, the uh, the major um, uh, progress over the last uh, uh, 30 days is number one is that uh, uh, Mr. Hummingbird uh, through the Gaming Commission they're going to submit a new Title IV, okay, uh, that is going to uh, be submitted to the rules and be passed, and therefore we're we we're, we stop codifying Title IV since there's going to be a new Title IV, and we just We'll, we'll uh, uh, supplement uh, that in. Um, the uh, oh, well, I forget the young lawyer, the, the blonde lawyer. What's her name? Chrissy. Chrissy. Chrissy uh, 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 did a, uh, uh, a total revision of. Uh, that's the best way I could find you know, <laughs> to describe her. Uh, uh, she, she did a, uh, a total re uh, revision, I believe, of Title 18, and that's all good to go. We've got just a few more titles left, but we're, we're making progress. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Henry? Okay. Mr. Henry, 
Item 9 is Cherokee Nation Education Corporation, Margaret Raymond. Shelly, do you want to explain what happened on that particular one? Getting ahead of ourselves. It's not supposed to be on the agenda until next month. They report quarterly. So we'll just withdraw this. Under old business, for once we were ahead of ourselves. Under old business, Item 1 is mortgage foreclosures. I think whenever, Melanie, whenever this first started out, it kind of had a more of an illegal framework. But now it's getting more into programming, etc. Would it be better to have it in community service so Mr. Sutherland doesn't have to report or to two different committees? Well, there is a foreclosure purchase program that you all approved to be in the IHP. And we assigned that internally to David Sutherland. So it might be good now that we sort of have evolved from identifying foreclosures over to now looking at them and identifying possible purchases and repurposing those houses. David Sutherland is going to be the one that's going to be the key person on that. So if we put it in community services, then you're going to have that dialogue because we usually have attorneys here for rules as opposed to David. So we're going to have the right people there to discuss it. I make a motion that at her suggestion that we move it to the committee that Sutherland reports to. Do we have a second? Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think. Do you have any ideas on that? Is that good? I think if we do it in May, Mr. Thornton, then they will be ready for the budget period. So if it was to take additional okay. money for the budget, that uh, Doug would calculate saying. that into the budget. I'm assuming that's what you said the equation is to make. So the purpose is to analyze it annually? Mm. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I just have one other question. I, have I given a floor? Or, uh, I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. It's for the whole 14 counties? Yes, that, that's the way I intended it to be all 14 counties. Okay. Any other questions? I have some questions. Um, Todd, maybe this is a question for you. What is the definition of car allowance that's not in here? Um, how do we determine what is car allowance? If, if we ever, heaven forbid, if we ever get sued, what basis do we have to say this is uh, a car allowance? What would be a good definition? Well, you know, it, it is it is a tribal, I mean, it's a tribal, tribal, tribal stipend uh, for uh, tribal, uh, tribal counselors to uh, that they would get uh, it's 700, right? Yes. 700 for all travel within the 14 county areas. Now, whatever definition you want, uh, whatever title you want to put on put on that vehicle allowance, car allowance. Um, uh, tribal uh, stipend. Uh, you know, if, if anyone feels any more comfortable with that, but that's what it is, and that's the the, the intent is to say instead of uh, doing uh, keeping logs and, and char charging, you know, uh, mileage, or, you know, or, or, or doing you know map to map uh, or location to location uh, mileage, uh, you're going to uh, uh, receive this amount, and, and you won't have to do the rest of that. I'm mindful that this will be a taxable uh, event, correct, Doug? Mm -hmm. the, the, tr the travel staff in the car allowance is a taxable event, right? Yes. yes. So what does that mean? We have to turn in the W? Well, the, uh, my, my understanding, the way I understand this plan, is, is this would be considered a non-accountable plan under mm -hmm. IRS code. It would be a taxable reimbursement. And it would be up to each tribal council member to keep mileage logs if they wanted to offset the tax implications on their personal tax return. But the nation will treat it as W-2 income under um, the, uh, I believe it's publication number 517. Um, I can get all of you that publication again from the IRS, but it, it will be treated as a, uh, it's called a non-accountable plan which has a couple of requirements on it. One, um, that allowance would, uh, any excess of utilization of the funds would not need to be returned. Uh, that's the main one that, that treats it as a W-2 income. Um, but, and the rest doesn't matter because it's already met that one uh, under definition of allowance. Um, how do we know that $700 is reasonable. Buell, how did we come up with $700? We, we, took the, we took the yearly averages of, uh, what did we do, a couple of years or so? Uh, 2008. Uh, last year, the year we just closed. And we just basically averaged it out that way. Of what so we averaged it out about $700? What people it, was traveling. It, the uh, maximum amount was about that. maximum amount was $600 a month, Mr. Baker. Mm -hmm. There were mm -hmm. several right at the $500 a month level, and then everyone else fell in below that. I, I think I distributed an analysis to everyone a month ago, maybe, uh, pertaining to that. So if we ended up in a court of law, Todd, that, that's reasonable. I'll defend anything you don't do. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, what... Um, what we, you know, is it reasonable? You know, that's always in the eye of the beholder. You know, if, if your top end 600 and you go 700, and you know, and, and you know, also you'd have to take in, into account the, uh, uh, the, the the changing, uh, you know, duties and responsibilities of. Well, I won't say duties and responsibilities, but the, ch the changing actions of the council. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the councilors today are, are a, a lot more active than they were, you know, five years ago, ten years ago. Uh, you know, uh, and it, as part of the, uh, the, the maturing of, uh, of, of this council. Uh, so uh, uh, is it reasonable? I mean, I'd be happy to defend it. Uh, uh, you know, 
what reasonable means is that reasonable people could differ, you know, also. So that's the way I would put it. And are there disclosure requirements when you have a car allowance? I don't know. For instance, are you required to, I noticed that open records act was in here. Are we required to disclose what our travel expenses are under this stipend? I think under the policy, everything that is under this policy is going to be considered a public document in accordance with FOIA. Okay. And we would all agree that transparency of government equates good government. So I would take the position that all your travel records are available for discovery under FOIA and actually, you know, for the most part should be available upon request. You know, we're here to be servants of the people. And if the people want to know, they have the right to know. Just counting lots for Mr. Baker and then the other Mr. Baker. Were you done too? Yeah. Okay. I just think for me, because I read the IRS regulations and stuff, even with our changes in policy that allowed more coverage of mileage, there was still a lot of mileage I wasn't accounting for that already went on my taxes that didn't get reimbursed. So I know that I will continue to keep my logs and my calendar logs. I have multiple documentation to show should it come to question with either a lawsuit, the IRS, all the different things that we get to be looked at through the glass fishbowl as elected officials. So I felt confident when that amount, because there was a variety of amounts that came up in dialogue, you know, leading up to $700. I felt confident for me that I would probably still be taking off money on taxes even beyond the $700 and that that still wasn't probably going to fully compensate the law or the cost of doing business for the tribe. But I also don't think it would be to the benefit of the people. We're not at the point where we should have vehicles the same as the chief or deputy chief either from the tribe. So it was, I thought the $700 was a balance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I really thought I was going to be against this. But after listening to some of the other folks and all, I mean, I travel a great deal that I've never documented. I never turn in, you know, that because, you know, when you go on tribal business, I don't know that I always want to call it tribal business, you know. And I mean, and there's a myriad of things that, you know, some people charge mileage for going to funerals. Some people charge mileage for dinners, you know, different things. And there's so many gray areas that, I mean, time after time, in years I didn't even turn in any mileage. But I do have one clarification. If under this policy I went to Oklahoma City for a meeting, do I just charge mileage from Tulsa on and back to Tulsa? I mean. Yeah, it's not porthole to porthole. No, I understand. That was my clarification. So I wouldn't, there wouldn't be any double dipping if they left Tahlequah or Stillwell or whatever and counted all the way to Oklahoma City and all the way back. Your mileage begins at the end of the year. At the Cherokee Nation line and back to it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Yes. I know that the large counselors are exempt from this, but it seems to me that this is inequitable to the people within, to the counselors within the Cherokee Nation. For example, someone driving from Barlowsville to Tahlequah for meetings and someone coming from Tahlequah to meetings gets exactly the same. So I don't see that it's fair to all the counselors. And I think that the actual mileage reimbursement is a much more equitable position. So I'm going to vote against it. Any comments? Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm kind of interested in this. What was he talking about? That, that the mileage that you paid, you can file with the IRS for the mileage that you wasn't paid? Is that, and claim that on your IRS? Um, even though, okay, let's say, for instance, you receive a uh, allowance of, mm -hmm. of X number of dollars a month. Mm -hmm. That would come to you as taxable income. What you would need to do mm -hmm. to offset that is keep mileage records at the at the government's mileage rate, and that would reduce your taxable. And that's <clears> on <throat> your personal tax return. That's not going to well, be. Uh, you know, I know there's a special form to, to fill out. I know the records that I keep, and I keep it on my vehicle. It's on the vehicle I drive. That's what I use it for. And I take off all the mileage that I claim with the Cherokee Nation. And then the mileage that's left over, you can claim it on IRS because it's business, right? Unreimbursed mileage? Yes. Unreimbursed, Unreimbursed mileage. mileage currently, the way you're doing it right now, is, is a valid expense on the tax. <laughs> they just have stipulations to ensure that it is business related. But well, that it always good. comes up quite a bit more than <laughs> But we're reimbursed. Yeah. So you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for this for that cause, but I'm still going to be able to claim quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. that I want to reimburse for. So I think I've got it now. Okay. <laughs> Thank and you. And I can visit with anyone individually if yeah. you if you want. You know, if you have any further questions. I think the mileage reporting is important as a basis for, uh -huh, as a basis for your annual review of this particular policy also. Yeah, no, that's something we never did currently. We, they've always wanted to come and get our mileage, what we've used, mm -hmm. but they never did want to say, well, how much mileage did you not get reimbursed for? You you know, that's never been a factor. I always turn that in on the um, Well, sure. I mean, the people. Oh, yeah. You know, our people. Any yeah. other questions? Here we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 But I'm so sorry, Mr. Crittenden. Go ahead. You, you want to report the vote? Uh, I just had a, a problem with some of the wording in this, in this thing, and it sounds the second sentence. It says, this vehicle allowance is to allow tribal council members to attend meetings and conduct tribal business within the jurisdictional boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. I've been able to do that ever since I've been on the council. So I haven't been restrained from going to meetings anywhere I wanted to within 14 County. The only uh, restraint I had was I didn't claim mileage in my own county. So I, it, something don't... It don't quite fit what we're doing here. It doesn't seem to in that in that particular sentence. If it said this, this will allow. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it needs to say, but it seems a little bit awkward to me. That's my comment. Okay, we have we voted. Okay, now all those opposed. Aye. Uh, uh, aye. Roll we'll call. Uh, yes, and you support? No, we don't. Bill Englund? Yes. Bill John Baker? No. Jack Baker? No. Harley Buzzard? Yes. Julia Cubs? <coughs> no. Uh, Bradley Cobb? Yes. Joe Crittenden? No. Jody Fishing Hop? No. Meredith Fraley? No. Janelle Fulbright? Yes. Don Garvin? Yes. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Tina Gloria Jordan? Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. Chris Soap? No. David Thornton? Yes. Kara Callen Watts? Yes. <coughs> We have nine yes and seven no.
Nine yes, seven no, motion carries. Oh, yes, Mr. Just to, to, to clarify, now, although you have pa uh, passed this policy, it is not the, the law of the land, okay? The, the, uh, the act that uh, uh, was uh, vetoed uh, still leaves in place the original act. So, therefore, uh, before this policy would be followed, you, uh, there has to be a vote either to sustain or over override the veto. And I just wanted to make... So we're still operating under the law that's in effect right now. That is correct. And the policy that's not this one, but the other one. The, I mean, the old one. The old, uh, yeah, the, the law. And this is effective as soon as the new law is approved at the end. Correct. Okay. All mine's clear? No, ma'am. Okay, uh, item three is uh, resolution setting dates for tribal council committees. Mr. Dr. Cobb. Madam Speaker, I'd like to withdraw this resolution at this time, please. I'll be quiet, please. I'd like to withdraw this resolution at this time, please. Item three is withdrawn. Okay, item four is a resolution confirming David Blue as a member of the Board of Directors of Cherokee Nation Business. Um, who is presenting that? Yoni? Oh, you want to do it yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not seeing me. I'm, I'm not seeing me. I, 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 I was just doing it. I am. Mr. Blue, I think uh, we some of us have questions. If you will bear with us for a few moments. Um, anyone have? Oh, yes, Mr. Baker. I make a motion that you be approved. Second. Moved and second. Discussion. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Jordan. Now, which one are we approving for? Item four, your old business. It was tabled last time. It's a director, nominated as a director of Cherokee Nation Business. Thank you. Mr. Soap. Yeah, uh, Mr. Luke, can you just provide us with some information on how long you've been part of the existing board uh, and or boards? Uh, my understanding you may have served on previous uh, C&I boards or whatnot. Could you just kind of give us a brief example of your experience? Okay. For one thing I was going to mention is this is totally separate from the new business on C&I that will come up. <coughs> and Jim Carrington is going to explain that separately. But I have been on the C&I board now for, I guess, about four years, uh, chairman of that board. That was, I was fortunate enough to uh, step into that role right after the GDG investment and work all the way through that. And uh, what they have done at the C&B level is they have asked for all of the chairs from the other boards to at least have a, the chair and one representative from that board at the C&B level, which is the holding company level so that they can adequately represent those C&E, Jay Hanna, uh, Lloyd Armstrong, myself, those other uh, businesses. The other thing that I do on the C&B board is I serve as the, uh, the audit chairman uh, for that board. I do have a background there in the CPA, and, and I do have a background uh, in that. But uh, So starting... I don't know, probably four years ago, I've been involved in, and uh, I don't have the exact dates with me, Chris, but, uh, and I've been on the, uh, been on the CNB board now for only probably about a year and a half, two years. Any other questions for Mr. Blue? Yes, Jordan. I, I know we're going to talk about these other boards, and this may not be the right time, but since it's up here, I'm going to go ahead and make sure. These other boards that you're being considered for today, they are non-paying positions. No. Non-compensate. And, non and you will not be going, they're not, like a lawyer, we're, we're only on CNB right now. Well, it makes a difference on whether I vote, how I vote on this, if I want to, I need to know a little more about these boards. They're really, we can't say that, we're considering this gentleman for 11 boards today. And I want to know how these 11 boards all work together. The, yeah, these are all CNI, correct? 
Correct. CNI subsidiary, I guess you call them subsidiary. This right now is only the CNB business board. But if he's on CNI and CNB and nine other boards, I want to be sure he has time for all this that we're putting on his plate. I do not get compensated other than for CNI and CNB. Any of these others that I would be put on are non-compensated boards. And we can go into that, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. I guess I can be out of order, Meredith. I guess, I mean, I apologize. Ms. Camelot, if the chair and the body would concede, because I'm going to pick on Buell. He leans over and he said, I thought the printer went wrong when he saw all the names. And I understand what he's talking about. I think, especially because of his importance of his chair position, if we could go ahead and hear how they're structuring these various boards. Because I do struggle, even if they're non-compensated, even if you're just signing a few papers, how would you physically be able to attend to any kind of business being on? Or is it purely reasons of the 8A structure, you know, and it's just by name only, and how they're going to operate that? I would be interested as well. Okay. Because I think that, but Curtis, do you have a question also? No, answer that question. Okay. The structure for the new codes on CNI is primarily driven by our need to have 8A companies in place. We lost two contracts in the last two years. One in particular, which was a chiropractic contract that cost us about a million dollars. Because we did not have, we were not proactive in setting up businesses that were 8A. It takes probably two years on average to get those companies set up. So the board itself has been pushing Brian, Jim, saying we can't lose any more of these contracts. We have got to get these companies set up so that when the opportunity presents itself, we are qualified. We're sitting there with the motor running so we can take advantage of the opportunity. Now, the technical reason that I'm on all these documents, I am going to defer to Mr. Carrington because I have just agreed I would do it. So if he wants to go ahead and elaborate a little bit, that's good. Thank you. I am the one that dragged David into this, and I'll be glad to tell you why. And they're for very technical reasons. The good news about the Small Business Administration is that they allow tribes great advantages under the program. But by virtue of the name, it has to be a small business. So you have a company like Brian C&I, which has grown. The best way to take advantage of the SBA program is to have several small businesses. So what's actually happening is we're taking C&I, which has many divisions, logistics, construction, telecom. And we're spinning those out into separate legal entities so that each one of them can apply to become its own 8A company. So that's why we have several, which is one of the other advantages the SBA allows tribes to have. You can have several 8A companies, whereas most people can only own one. So that's why we have several. The question as to how David will handle this, let me directly answer time-wise how that will be handled. We have already, they have, three companies, three operating companies, C&I, C&D, and CMS. The latter two are 8A companies, which were spun out really the exact same way we're doing this. But they don't have three different meetings, and they don't have all the board members running to each of these meetings. They have one board meeting. And David, at the beginning of the meeting, calls to order the boards of A, B, and C company. Next time he may have to say A, B, C, and go through X. And as we continue to grow, we hope we have the problem that we have several more small companies. But we'll have one board meeting. David will call them all together. That way, if a policy is passed that's intended to apply to all these companies, it applies to all the companies. If you did try to divide it up and have several meetings, and if you had several different board members, it may be that maybe you don't have a quorum for this one, and something doesn't get passed. And then you have a logistical problem where you've got some policies that apply to some of their companies and some that don't. So that's how that would be handled, one big meeting. Jim, since we're out of order here anyway, when there are common board members, for instance, David's on C&B, plus he's on all these others, 
Does that give rise to any directive liability in regard to piercing this LLC bail? They will. There are various elements that you can look at, and you're usually starting from the bottom and going up. So, for example, if you have, you're usually talking about a subsidiary. So if this is a subsidiary of C&B, which it would be, these new codes, if they want to see is this just an alter ego, is it really the same company, they'll look at things such as do you have common board members, maybe do you have common management. So that is one element. But we have that situation with all of our subs now, which is why it's important for us to actually have board meetings that are duly called, board minutes. We have to follow the corporate, basically the corporate rules. You just have to be more careful to follow those. So, yes, that is one of several elements they might look at, but we've always been comfortable that we follow the corporate rules to make sure that that's not an issue. So is there anything definitive that describes that relationship between C&B and whatever they call it? And a new code? There is not, other than the fact that they own them legally. You know, they're pushed there because of the SBA rules, which I'll be glad to explain why. So C&B board, they're more of a supervisory role, not involved in the operations, so to speak. Exactly. In fact, having this separate board installed between C&B and these new codes, that helps insulate the parent company. So it's a good thing to have an intermediate board. And that, as you think about it, C&B, because it also owns C&E, it's good to have that insulation. So this actually helps that issue. Has C&B board even requested? Yeah. Mr. Snell? Thank you, Jim. Sure. Oh, were there any other questions of Mr. Kerry? You took my question, so I'm good. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, that was great. Mr. Snell? Oh, Todd, sorry. And this may go to Jim. I guess the one question I had is that you mentioned, you know, dividing up, you know, getting to the smaller LLCs for 8A status. If we had many similar board of directors on these LLC companies, would that survive an 8A audit? I mean, would that come into question that, you know, well, here, you know, we're just trying to qualify for them? You know, could you address that? Yeah, it's a great question because that's something that's specifically addressed in the SBA rules under the tribal sections. You have affiliation rules. And as you might guess, people may set up a lot of 8A companies, spin them out, and in order to stay small. But because tribes are allowed to have several, that's anticipated. The rules specifically allow for a non-affiliation. There's a non-affiliation rule for tribal companies. And so they specifically say that these entities, 8A companies owned commonly by a tribe, will not be affiliated because of common management, and that includes common boards. So there's a specific exemption for that. Any other questions for Mr. Carrington? Mr. Blue, would you mind coming back? Sure. Mr. Snell. This question kind of more or less said I question. Should we put it all together? Well, my question is, Mr. Blue, we would like to see from CNI some sort of business plan, how we're going to bring this company forward. It's kind of getting in the red more or less maybe or getting behind. And I'm sure you all have a good business plan. We'd like to see it. Okay. This next board meeting, which is coming up on the 30th, I've actually sat down with Brian Dave Stewart, and he will be outlining what I would call a five-year plan and a timeline for how CNI fits within a business model associated with that. As we know, CNI, it's had some contracts that's centered into over the years. It has been focused on hiring Cherokees, which is a very good thing. But as you try to manage your way into more profitability, you have to slowly let those contracts rotate off or the non-profitable ones. So we are shifting our focus more to making sure we've got margin contracts. And I think if you look, we had earnings this month, and also in the aerospace piece of the business, that may be one of the first times. And that's the one that employs the most Cherokees. 
I think there's 465 Cherokees employed right now at CNI, and there's 80 something percent that are Cherokee. You got 11 million dollars worth of salaries that it pays out each year, so you're paying approximately a little over eight million dollars in salaries to Cherokees. If you start multiplying the impact of that out into your economies, your multiplier should be at least two and a half times whatever you're spending on those salaries. So CNI is is doing a lot to uh, to help Cherokees and to help those uh, economies, but we can also do that and make a profit as well. Uh, so, um, and that is certainly something that's being focused on right now. Any other questions, Mr. Blue, in regard to item four, the nomination to the Cherokee Nation Business Board? <coughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, under new business, uh, item one is a resolution waiving uh, sovereign immunity for the bank first agreement. Uh, this was brought up about two months ago. It was on the, uh, I think, the Bank of Oklahoma loan here in Tallapaw for uh, the nursing center there in Jay. And I think uh, Bank First. Yeah. Bank First. Bank First here in Tallapaw. And I believe that's been worked out. Uh, as I stated before, I think this is a good option for the Cherokee Nation to enter into. And I make a motion for the approval of this resolution. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item two is the resolution to confirm the nomination of Wayne Dunham to the Housing Authority Board. Make a motion to be approved. Second. I believe Mr. Dunham is here. Yes. Aye. You want to come aye. forward just in case anybody has any questions? <coughs> No, I don't really have any questions. Uh, I've been on the board since 2001, if I can just take a second. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate being on the board. I think we've done a lot of good for the uh, Cherokee people. There's been a re big restructuring between the Cherokee Nation and the Housing Authority, and we're still very active and, and uh, uh, enjoy doing this. Any questions for Mr. Dunn? It's Mr. Becker. I just wanted to ask Amy if she had anything bad to say about him. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. I just wanted to say, uh, anybody that, just from past experience of one of my uh, constituents that was on the Housing Authority Board, I believe that this is one of those boards and commissions that we have that just probably deserves a Medal of Honor for the things they put up with. <laughs> so we appreciate you, and thank, well, thank you, you very for much. returning to this. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being and, here today. And if I could, Madam Chair, one more item before I leave, and I, I want to turn my hat. Uh, I'm also the mayor at Jay, and I want to thank the Cherokee Nation and the, and the council. Uh, we just went through a disaster this week. I've had four hours of sleep since Monday morning, but our water plant went down. Uh, we had to close the school. We had to close one of our, our, our major industry in Jay due to the water is a poultry plant, and they use a lot of water. And uh, I visited with Hardy several times, and I think we had to close the clinic one day. And Cherokee Nation stepped in, and we got our water going uh, Tuesday evening. We was able to have get the school back going yesterday. We didn't have our back teas back uh, from the health department, but we had water for them, for them to flush the stools and stuff. And the Cherokee Nation stepped forward and brought uh, enough water for all the kids to drink at the school for we could get them back in because they've lost enough time with the snow. And I just want to thank you all for that and all the efforts that you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Okay, item three is uh, confirming the nomination of Brad Carson to the Cherokee Nation Education Corporation. Ginger? Oh. <laughs> so like you no. no. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the uh, Education Corporation is, has recommended three 
uh, honorary board members yeah. for the board, and I believe there will be no, non voting members. Yeah. I move for approval of three, four, and five. Second. Second on um, items three, four, and five in total. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Item six is confirming the nomination of David Ballou to the Cherokee Medical Services Board. Um, Brian, are you presenting that one? Yes, I'm presenting. Um, and do we want to? Let's go ahead and present from item six through 16. Okay. So Brian, do you, do you mind just very briefly sure. explaining when you get to each one what the what these companies are meant to do? Okay. Okay. Uh, on item number six, uh, again, uh, presenting David Blue as the uh, uh, chairman, as chairman of CNI right now, that these business units all fall within the CNI fiduciary responsibilities. Item six, Cherokee Medical Services, is currently an 8A company. Uh, it's in its approximate year number six. Uh, it has a uh, three-year average uh, of around $26 million. And we only are qualifying for certain types of contracts within that 8A. A uh, majority of medical service contracts for 8As are typically in a $6.5 million average, three-year average. And if you're over that, you can't compete in that area. So what we've done, and I'm going to kind of maybe bounce here just a little bit on you. So what we've done is on um, Cherokee Nation Healthcare Services and Cherokee uh, Nation Health Group item 11 and 12, those are new codes. One is being structured for to go in as an 8A applicant for an 8A application. One will be structured just to be an SDB. Uh, it can be advanced into an 8A in the future if need to be. But that is to give us the uh, ability to go after more medical contracting services. Um, number seven, Cherokee Nation Aerospace and Defense is just a new code. It's basically been structured and set up. There is not a formal uh, piece of business that we're placing there. We've structured this for a opportunity, uh, for a future opportunity, just to have it ready to go. Um, or Whatever the opportunity might be, okay. uh, more than more than likely it will be probably be uh, pushed into an 8A, but there's not a current any current business flowing through that particular <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> item number eight, uh, Cherokee Nation Construction Services, uh, is a new co. Currently, all the construction uh, progress or pro uh, projects fall under the current CND. Uh, we have carved off a little bit of the new business flowing under this new account. Um, primarily, that is one of the problems that we had was when we pushed construction into CND, it took the three-year average of CND up to the point that we couldn't chase some of the other contracts that were currently flowing as eight days under that. So part of the strategy was surrounded what happened, what David mentioned earlier about contracts that we could no longer compete on is because we didn't have uh, companies strategically positioned and ready to take on opportunities. And it's not so much about our opportunities that we may have internal between the companies, but the 8A life, the shelf life, is as there's many companies out there that are in 8A. And if they haven't positioned themselves to come out of 8A and be successful, a lot of times they look for partners when they enter in the last portion of their uh, life as an 8A company. They look for people that they can partner with to move those 8A contracts over to. We want to be in a position to where opportunities are coming to us and we have the vehicles, the contract vehicles set up, structure set up to take advantage of that. Um, so number eight, uh, again, is a construction. It will be uh, something that we are pushing for 8A as well. Uh, number nine, Cherokee Nation Distributors. That is currently C&D. Uh, C&D is currently at the 8A. They're in their year seven, approximately in the year seven of the 8A. And so they will be uh, coming out of the 8A very soon. Uh, item 10, Cherokee Nation Distribution uh, was set up primarily for Opportunities. We're running our office products division. We'll be running through there, as well as any other opportunities of distribution, uh, 3PL services of warehousing. 
a lot of uh, major major uh, corporations look for um, opportunities to manage warehouses or manage product lines. Um, I don't have th that one set up uh, going to the 8A at this point, but again, it's it's to be able to go 8A, you have to have two years of business to even go into the application mode. You can request a waiver if you have the, the right management and some business, but having these structured and laid out to where we can start putting revenue into them positions us to go into the 8A with them if needed. Uh, let's see here, number 11 and 12, we've talked about 13, logistics. Uh, no current business structured for that right at the moment. It was just set up to be prepared for opportunity. Fourteen, Cherokee Nation Red Wing was utilized for the new acquisition of the aerospace machine shop in Kellyville. That one is going to be going to an 8A. Uh, we will be putting an 8A application in for that. Uh, Fifteen, Cherokee Nation Technology. Uh, that is the Cisco products and engineering group that we have that falls under, within under CNI. Right now it was part of the telecommunications group. We're carving that out to go to an 8A. <coughs> Cherokee Nation Telecommunications uh, currently is in Tahlequah. That flows through CNI. That is commercial business. Uh, we want to be able to go to the, into the government, so we're separating and going to carve that out of CNI or just take the government piece and flow it through the telecommunications. Uh, same business, just a different customer. And we are looking at taking that in the, in the future to an 8A. It's not structured right now to be one of our immediate 8As, but just strictly to set it up and start flowing revenue through it so that we can go into that government business with the telecommunications. Hopefully that kind of sums up a brief summary of what we're trying to accomplish here is to put ourselves in a position for opportunities that are out there and to segregate um, some of the business units that's been compiling underneath CNI and CND, CND for over the years. Excuse me, Ryan, Mr. Carter. Madam Speaker, I make a motion to approve item 6 through 16. Second. Move through second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Thank you, Harris. Good. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Carrington and Mr. Blue. Oh, and Brian, you too. Okay. <laughs> okay. Item 17 is a resolution. Okay. Item 17 is a resolution recognized commending uh, University of Oklahoma student uh, in Turkey, citizen Sam Bradford. Thank you for approval. Second. Move to the second. Any discussion? Mr. I think Mr. Baker and then Mr. Garvin. Yes. I am very much in favor of this, especially since he's one of my constituents. But uh, I would like to request from the administration that they ask if Sam Bradford, at least his father, if possible to be present at our council meeting. <coughs> Uh, this night, we'll certainly extend the invitation to him. And I, I believe his appearance might be limited. I don't know about his family, but we'll walk him again. Arts coach, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Garvin? Uh, I think we should include the 2007 2013 tribal council members as also sponsors. They got left out. I'll second that. This doesn't include the people that are six year term. This implies it's just the people that are on the oh. four year term. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the yeah. So you want everyone as a small All in favor, sing. Oh, we already did that. Didn't we? No. no, we didn't. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Go to the same side. Motion carried. Okay, any announcements? Next meeting is April 30 at 1 o'clock. Mr. Baker. Uh, 
a uh, email and it says, unfortunately, I'm stuck in Tulsa with car trouble. It's going to be Council Dominic and Aunt, uh, Charles Jr. Thank you. And motion to adjourn. You be adjourned. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Aye.